Okay. Uh, well, welcome to you all to this special Vine for Victory, Britain's Navy, Army and Air Force in myth and memory, which is part of the National Army Museum, Royal Air Force Museums and National Museum of the Royal Navy's commemorations of V-Day, 75 years ago on Friday the 8th of May. And uh, I'm joined uh, for a discussion this, uh, this afternoon by Matthew Sheldon, Executive Director of Museum Operations, National Museums of the Royal Navy, uh, Dr. Harry Raphael, um, Historian of the Royal Air Force Museum, and Dr. Peter Johnson, Head of Collection Research and Academic Access at the National Army Museum. Um, welcome to you all. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on board. And um, I'm rather rubbing my hands together at the prospect of this one. I mean, you know, vying for victory and uh, vying for memory, more importantly, is, um, is, is such an interesting one, isn't it? And uh, the biases um, that have come through since 1945 and the, and the mythology that has taken hold is also really, really interesting, I think. Um, one of the things I just want to start off with is a quote from that legend that is Field Marshal um, Earl Alexander of Tunis. Uh, one of the greatest British war commander, um, British commanders we had, and certainly um, the most experienced battlefield commander, probably on any side in the Second World War. He's the only commander, I think, to have um, commanded troops in battle at every rank uh, possible, from second lieutenant all the way up to field marshal. Anyway, he says, said in 1943, the secret of modern warfare is a correlation of the three elements we live in, land, air, water. Army, Air Force and Navy must become a brotherhood. And, you know, I think he was personally, I think he's bang on, on the money. And I think what's really interesting about the Second World War is that you see that Britain and the United States, particularly Britain and her dom and dominions, so I include Canada and Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, etc. in that, um, they are definitely fighting by that middle stage of the war, a kind of, well, all stages of the war, a tri-service operations where you see the Soviet Union um, and Nazi Germany, I suppose, particularly much more sort of land centric. Japanese less so, of course, but, but um, certainly the core of the Axis powers is, is a kind of land kind of conflict, really. We're not fighting that way. Um, I'm going to turn first to you, Matthew, if I may. I mean, what's your your take? I, I'm, I'm, my personal view is that the, the Royal Navy gets, gets, you know, despite being the senior service in 1939, gets probably the least plaudits. And yet the Battle of the Atlantic, I think one can argue, is the most important battleground, albeit on water, of the entire Second World War. Yeah, I mean, of course, I'm going to agree with that. You know, the Navy is the senior service. But I think when we look at myth and memory, It'll be interesting to look at the reasons for why perhaps the Navy hasn't earned its place in the sun. Sure. Um, but I think it's important. Um, we often think when we think about VE Day, and I guess here we are, 75th anniversary of VE Day, we think about the road to liberation and, and ultimately May 45. But if you'd kind of just allow me a little bit of a kind of long perspective, because I think the thing about the Navy, let's look at it in 1939. It went into that war with a strategy um, that was about a long war. It was going to be about blockade. It was going to be about, um, you know, choking um, economic supply to um, a, a continental enemy and, you know, getting all the benefits and, and the long approach that it took in the First World War. I think that's really important. Clearly, that changes radically, you know, when you get our withdrawal from the mainland in, in June 40. Um, and, you know, that long campaign um, doesn't look so good in an era of blitzkrieg and it doesn't look so good when you lose your ally France and you then you know have an enemy who has access to the Atlantic so I think it's important I think one of the things I'd want to give credit to the Navy for is the way that it's able to react um, and build some new navies so that by 1943 you've got a coastal forces navy or you've got combined operations that can take on a different role you know, and can get us back onto the mainland, and then you start to see the push and, and so on. But um, I mean, I think it's worth starting with Battle of the Atlantic, James, if you're happy. I mean, it's um, you've set us quite a challenge to summarize <laughs> these things in five to seven minutes because you know, Battle of the Atlantic happens, you know, we fight in, in the North Atlantic in September 39, and we have to keep that control right through to May 45. There are, you know, over a million square miles of sea 
yes. that over a thousand North Atlantic convoys alone, um, you know, there are hundreds of convoy actions and the phases, I mean, it's such a long war, I think that allows many adjustments and developments through, through the war, whether they are operational, um, tactical, uh, strategic, um, whether they're to do with our allies. So the complexity is, is incredible. Um, I mean, we set up right from the word go, aren't we, to fight a, you know, it, it, it is our belief that this is going to be another long attritional war in which access yeah. resources is going to win out. Yeah. So the first, first challenge, once the Germans attack in 1940, is to resist that, avoid any kind of, any kind of invasion, so that you can then concentrate for the long haul. So the first challenge is that, and actually the Royal Navy meets that very well because it's although Norway and is a, is a land defeat for the British and French, it is most absolutely unquestionably uh, a naval victory for the Royal Navy. Yeah. Um, then you've got the great naval triumph of Dunkirk, and Dunkirk is is not all about the little ships. I would say about five percent. Would you agree with that? Uh, is lifted by little ships? Yeah. I mean, most of the most of the three hundred thirty eight thousand are lifted by large ships and those from the Royal Navy. Organized. Yeah, and I, I Navy. think we should remember that quite often those little ships are crewed by naval personnel. You know, and you should remember the people who weren't just took off, taken off from Dunkirk, but came out of the other French ports. You know, through naval vessels. So. And then I think you're right, the connection to Norway, which we think of as, as a disaster, I think is important because we really sink a significant part of the German destroyer force there. And mm. that means that we're able to do those destroyer operations at Dunkirk and lift people off. So I think you're right, you know, we, the, I think in a lot of ways, the most intense part of the Navy's war um, is up to 43 it takes its most significant losses in personnel in 41 and 42 most significant sinkings of ships in 42 um, yeah. and then what it fights from 43 and 44 onwards is not always typical because it is then focused it's having to <clears throat> fight an amphibious war that it didn't prepare for didn't spend any of the 1930s um, training in joint exercises or building the ships that it's going to need to go back for amphibious landings so I think um, it's quite an intense early war for the Navy, um, which is important. And also and the scope of it, isn't it? I mean, obviously, the, yeah. the, the Atlantic is the number one. And it's yeah. not just about sending ships out there and building vast numbers of corvettes and more destroyers yeah. and all the rest of it. It's actually about technology. It's about yeah. developing the cavity magnetron, which enables yeah. um, a massive reduction size of, of radar so that it can fit on a, a corvette or, or a destroyer. It's about... Yeah improvements in high frequency direction finding it yeah. is about just the organization of it you know the yeah. of western approaches up in liverpool yeah. and, the, and the command center there it is about maintaining operations in the mediterranean it is about yeah. supporting what's going on in the, in the far east the range and scope of the role of his involvement in world war ii is absolutely astonishing yeah and i think that's absolutely right you know if you think about in the early months of the war it's down in the south atlantic you've got the commerce raiders and you've got that aspect of the war um, you've got the battles in the Mediterranean and you've got retention of a foothold in Malta. You've got something like the submarine service, the, the fighting tent, the flotilla that stays in Malta. And, you know, through it all is sinking hundreds of thousands of tons of Italian shipping and supplies that are destined for North Africa. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is, and, but I think Battle of the Atlantic is interesting because of, as you say, the, the different um almost kind of stepping um uh counter approach that, that goes on that there's one technological or operational change is made you have to counter it um and i think you know sometimes that's tactical sometimes it's about the escort groups specializing um and working together it's then then becoming support groups so they're freed up from actually protecting a convoy they're actually free to go and hunt and kill um, yeah. U-boats and you know I think it, it people think of it as coming to a peak in the spring of 43 when you know Dernitz uh, has to I think admit defeat and there are very high numbers of kills but in some ways by late 41 you know it's going to be tough but you can see I think ultimate victory because it's also to do with industrial capacity because we are building the shipping capacity from then and you know and it's expanding with new production um, in the UK, but also in the US, obviously. And that means he's not 
able to sink as much as we build. And yeah, there's well, going to be grim that, times. But and also, the, 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 the Liberty ship is designed by Cyril Thompson, who's a Brit who yeah. comes from Sunderland. Uh, I, I mean, I would argue that, that actually we get to a point where we're not going to lose the Battle of the Atlantic by mm. the end of May 1941. Because yeah. in the two months that pre precede that, March, April and May, you lose three of the greatest U-boat aces of all, yeah. um, Preen, Shepka and Kretschmer. Um, and because their start base is so small, the U-boat service at the start of the Second World War is so tiny, there isn't that depth of experience to kind of feed a rapidly expanding force. So once you yeah, lose yeah. those exits, that is really, really crippling. Then, of course, the Bismarck gets lost, plus yeah, Enigma yeah. machine and code, yeah. and, and code yeah. get captured. And that is, yeah. that is a game chamber, and, it, and it's a triumph of British yeah. prioritisation of, of research and development. Yeah, I mean, I think that capture by Bulldog in its, its May 41, I think, is, is exactly. absolutely vital. We then lose control of, 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 um, of the ability to read and decrypt the codes, but we get them back again. Um, <clears throat> I think the other thing to talk about, and I think particularly because we have, we have Harry here, is Coastal Command and how they come in, I think, from late 41 through 42. Yeah. And the number of U-boat kills, actually, that are made by Coastal Command, you know, I think it's, it's probably approaching something like 20%. Um, and that comes in quite late, and that has its own technical innovations as well. And it means yes, that I that, think it's very you know, important to understand that the Battle of the Atlantic is not just won by the Navy, it's also won yeah. by the RF as well. My last point, before I turn to Harry, I just mm -hmm. want to make the point that, of course, that, you know, even in August 1944, that is the creation of the Royal Navy's Pacific Fleet. So, you know, it's not like the Royal Navy's effort is diminished at any point in the war. It just keeps going right up until the end, and it really does deserve greater credit, I think. But anyway, thank you, Matthew. I'm going to turn to Harry now. And, and Harry, I'm sure you would completely agree about the role of the RAF in the Battle of the Atlantic. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think 20% is probably roughly right for Coastal Command. But if we just look at surface aircraft, I think they claim 41% of all U-boat kills oh. in the war, which I, I think speaks for itself in terms of the significance of aircraft in yes, their battle. Yes, those amazing, very long-range um, liberators armed with rockets that were kind of, were by 1943, homing in on surface U-boats and hammering them. Yeah, I think it's really important to understand the Liberator's role in this because it can fly over a thousand miles away from base, stay out there for about three hours, and if you compare that to what Coastal Command starts to war with, which is the Hudson, which is able to reach 500 miles and then pretty much turn back, yeah. and then the bombers which were in uh, service at that time, which Coastal Command essentially gets when they're outdated, they can reach about the same distance and stay there for two hours. So again, you compare that to what they're able to use at the end of a war, and it is a complete sea change. Mm. So I think certainly I'd agree the Battle of the Atlantic is one of the most important bits of war, and it's, it's perhaps indicative of how little attention is given to Coastal Command as well, but it's not yeah. well, well, widely I, praised in the RAF. We can talk, we can talk about why a, a, a little bit later on, but, but you know, Coastal Command is probably the most unappreciated area of Britain's armed forces in the Second World War, I would say. Yeah, yeah I, I think what's, uh, what's fascinating about Coastal Command is that it, it plays an incredibly important part in the Second World War, as, of course, naval aviation had done in the First World War. But between both the First World War and the Second World War and immediately post-war, it is the coastal aspects of the RAF which get the heaviest aspects of the cuts. And uh, there's a number of reasons for that, but that is a really interesting aspect of the RAF's experience in the Second World War. The fact that they, learn, they forget, along with a lot of other lessons, the importance of naval aviation in terms of supporting convoys, anti-U-boat warfare. Uh, they relearn those lessons during the course of the Second World War very effectively, and they get to the end of the Second World War. And again, Total Command goes, goes right back down in terms of size. That's because all of the armed services are facing these cuts. Uh, so it, it is a, it's an interesting aspect. Um, I think it's, it's quite nice to sit between Matthew and Peter, actually, because uh, air power really does play... Uh, the sort of the, the glue in making surface operations possible. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's tempting when you're in these sort of situations to make these grand claims about uh, you know one side winning winning the, the war and it's in its uh, on its own. Um, and I don't think any of us really can. But what is uh, fantastic about the RAF is that it allows all of the surface operations to take place. If you yes. don't have their superiority, as I think you see countless examples from Norway, Dunkirk is an example perhaps where even though the RF doesn't gain air superiority uh, and the Luftwaffe isn't able to prevent the naval evacuation, there's certainly heavy losses there which take their toll. Well, I, I think you can argue the Battle of Britain begins on 
the 23rd of May, which I think is when Fighter Command first enters the fray. You know, a Fighter Command is, is created and designed specifically to defend Britain, uh, you know, when Britain is imperiled. Um, so the fact that Fighter Command is, is supporting the evacuation of Dunkirk and the failure of the Dunkirk would unquestionably have imperiled Britain goes to show its importance and, and uh, I think certainly extends the reach of the Battle of Britain. You know, what's interesting there is, is, is the kind of utter failure of dive bombing, but that is a, a completely separate issue. I, I think what is interesting about the RAF though is, is that air power is absolutely central to um, Britain's rearmament in the 1930s and indeed Neville Chamberlain when he's Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1935, despite immense amount of pressure from the army, he goes no, 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 what we need to do is build up our air forces. You know, air forces have got to be, be absolutely central to it and central to this bigger strategy is steel, not flesh, which is to use global reach, mechanisation, modernity, technology to do as much of the hard yards as you possibly can so that you keep those are the coal face of war, infantry, armour and all the rest of it, to an absolutely bare minimum so that you avoid the mass slaughter that was experienced by a generation of young men in Britain between 1914 and 19, 1918. And that is an absolutely confirmed strategy, which is then picked up by the Americans as well, and, and maintained right through to the end of the war. And air power has an absolutely key part in that strategy. Yeah, I mean, the mechanisation of Britain's armed forces, are, I think Peter will probably speak about how... Uh, the army starts off uh, as a very mechanized force and continues that way but yeah air power is an important aspect of it it does take time to to relearn some of those lessons from the first world war i think we start to see that from north africa onwards of mm -hmm. course there's a lot of debates within the rf itself is about what is the appropriate application of of its air power resources so we talked about battle of the atlantic of course that's in direct competition for resources with bomber command and the bombing war continues to be one of the more controversial aspects of the Second World War. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think, something which we, because we're talking about V-Day 1945, something we have to talk about, you know, the, the strategy which keeps on going in terms of uh, area bombing versus precision bombing, which is perhaps an, an unfortunate term for the Americans to have. Well, not least because, because, because by, certainly by the middle of 19, well, certainly early part of 1944 there's not really much in it between the accuracy of daylight bombing and, and nighttime bombing because of advancement yeah. in in, uh, um, uh, in navigation aids and, and bomb aiming and and sort of new techniques developed sort of later on in 1944 by 617 squadron you know under the command of leonard cheshire i mean you know 617 squadron is say the most accurate bombing unit of the entire war wouldn't you I, I think it's, it is, but what's, but what's really important, you're right, is those navigation aids, because by the end of the war, it doesn't take specialist units to get uh, very accurate bombing. They've introduced a new G uh, navigation aid, which is using radio navigation to provide precise points for, for reaching targets and bomb dropping, and they've devised systems to incorporate that into attacks. And that means you are able to achieve a level of accuracy in terms of reaching targets, and it's been about target selection. And that's, that's the important aspect of the 45 Brigade. But uh, in terms of tactical air power as well, there's this debate about whether or not um, the air should be the first and foremost thing you're thinking about, or should it become later on in the plans? And it's, it takes a little while to develop that realization you need to have hand in hand, in hand approach when you're developing even naval or, or uh, ground plans with the air and, and vice versa. Well, the development of tactical air power is absolutely astonishing, really. And, and you know, because we, uh, the RAF emerges in the Second World War, <coughs> excuse me, with, um, with, with commands rather than kind of what the Germans do and the, and the Americans do of creating forces, air forces, uh, we have these commands. The, the creation um, in late 1941 into 1942 under Mary Cunningham and Tedder in, in North Africa of the Desert Air Force as, as a close air support um, formation. I think he's really, really important, and a lot of those develop the, a lot of those lessons, which are then developed further in Tunisia and beyond, then become the part of post-war doctrine in the U.S. Air Force and indeed the RAF. You know, it's it's that that is where those origins come in, um, and I think one can argue, and probably argue convincingly, that that Eighth Army is um, spared. Um, annihilation following the fall of Tobruk on the 21st of June 1942 by the absolute relentless pounding given to the Axis forces following up by the Desert Air Force. I mean it is absolutely remarkable and it's, a, it's, it's as much to do with the skill of the pilots and determination of the pilots in the command as it is to do with the operational level and that ability to leapfrog um, 
um, landing grounds back and forth and, and keep that pressure on over the front at all times. I mean, it's an absolutely phenomenal effort. And all these are taken forward into Tunisia, then Sicily, southern Italy, and of course, most of all, um, before D-Day in Northwest Europe. Yeah, the North African campaign it is a, a battle from airfield to airfield because that's what allows you to gain command and air superiority over the battlefields ahead and therefore attack ground troops and support the advance. And you're right about Teddy's uh, Middle East command. It is essentially the RAF in the Middle East. It has every single resource of the RAF underneath it. And it is very interesting to see how that allows tactical air power to be almost rediscovered. Yep. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And we should just just make, for those who are not aware, I mean, strategic air power is, is when air forces are operating, operating on their own steam without any support of the air ground troops or, or naval troops. Uh, and tactical air power is when you are directly supporting operations on the ground. I mean, that's a crude um, explanation, but just so that people know. But um, Peter, I, I must turn to you and, and, and the army. The army also gets um, not the greatest of press, I, I, I have to say. And I think uh, there is a sort of whole school of, of thought, um, loosely known as declinists, that basically think that the British were pretty rubbish, and particularly in the army, and never, never managed to kind of um, um, meet the kind of tactical chutzpah of the Germans, I, I would disagree with that. I mean, you know, my own research into this suggests that the army, British army, was pretty good. It was pretty good in 1940. Um, it developed further, and by 1944-45, it was a pretty pretty good unit, whether, pretty good outfit, whether it be in Northwest Europe or whether it be in the Far East. Yeah, I mean, uh, as in the interwar period, so, so in this discussion, the army does come in third place uh, in the hierarchy of where, of where we discuss things. You know, exactly as you were saying, the the Navy was going to be the, the forefront of, of Britain's defence and so therefore took the bulk of the defence spending. And then there was this idea about the importance of air forces. The bomber will always get through and so that yep. came in the second place. And then behind that you have the army. Um, and the, the British army of, you know, into, into 1939 is an organisation that is, is made up of a variety of conflicting uh, roles, plans, needs, uh, you know, yes, it is. it has a high level of mechanisation, absolutely, but it has no real serious armoured formations before 1938, so it is lagging on, on, on that scale. Uh, and also, you know, it, it's conflicting between what is it actually for? You know, is it to fight in continental Europe? Is it to conduct operations uh, in the empire in sort of lower key counterinsurgency police and stuff? Um, at which point there is no need for armour. There's this assumption that you can't use armour uh, anywhere in the empire, which, you know, actually pervades quite quite significantly through into, into, into the desert war. You know, you, you've, got these, uh, you've got these quite scathing assessments of some fairly brilliant generals uh, because, who say, well, you know, from the Indian army saying, well, they won't ever be able to do anything in, in, in North Africa or in Europe because they don't understand armor and they can't possibly understand armor coming from the Indian army. So you have this, this cultural divide that I think exists in the army that doesn't necessarily exist in other services uh, to, the, to the same extent. You know, you have these schools of thought, you've got the, 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 the British army per se versus the, the Indian army. But I mean, just, just looking at the army and, and coming back to your, your, your central point there about the reputation it's had, I mean, I 100% agree with you. I think it, it, it's been unfairly maligned um, you know, due to its performance. And when we talk about myth and memory, and, and certainly when we, when we do the Q&A about this on Crowdcast uh, at seven o'clock, following on from this, you know, people will be able to, to weigh in with their own questions about why this might be. But, you know, when you look at the size of the British Army in, in 1939, it's what, 224,000, I think is what tiny, the regular Army... Tiny, Yeah, that, that's what the regular army can call on. And then it's got, obviously, it's backed up by the territorial army, but, you know, in 1939, that is poorly trained, poorly equipped. Also, you have to understand that there's, there's no... There's, a, there's no history for having a large army, and B, it's not something that the British public would, would contemplate, because you only have a large army if you have conscription. And... and Public opinion in a democracy such as Britain wouldn't allow that. And also, where do you put them? You know, the, 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 the point of the Navy is to protect our sea lanes, not, not ferry the army about. I mean, you know, we have an alliance with France that, that we developed in 1939. France has the potential to have a massive army, so they can do the land bits and we'll do naval power and, and, and air power. So there's no need to have a, a, a large army. In, well, I mean, there's, there's, there's the idea that, you know, Britain will have a large army. Uh, but that large army will be preferably somewhere else. You know, that, that is, that, that's a hangover from the Victorian era. What, 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 that's what the army was for. The army was to hold on to empire um, and the Navy was to guarantee the trade. And then increasingly you have the Air Force uh, delivered into this environment that helps uh, us better, under, you know, better protect the, the, these areas. But, you know, 
from, from 224,000 to 2.9 million by the end of the war is a, is a significant increase. And I think actually what the army shows is it has this amazing ability to rapidly expand mm. um, and still deliver, but also be extremely effective and learn within that too. You know, we've talked a little bit about the development of, of, of air power. We've talked a little bit, Matthew mentioned, you know, very at the beginning about how the Navy changes what it actually does and picks up new specialism. The army is exactly the same. You know, you, you have these brand new things that just crop up that the army just takes on and, and challenges and it's actually learning in contact, which is an incredible skill. Uh, and, and that can only really be delivered through an, through an institutional organizational culture. Uh, well, and also, and look, look, at, look at what they achieve in the Far East. You know, in, in early part of 1942, they're getting absolutely whipped. You know, there's a loss of Malaya, Singapore, then Burma. You know, just two years later, in March 1943, 44 rather, you've got the largest clash of troops uh, on the ground in the, in the war against Japan um, at Imphal. Uh, which is a, just a superb victory and is one where they absolutely smash the Japanese 15th Army. I mean, just completely destroy it. Exactly. And, and, and by training right. tactics, use of equipment, all the rest of it, harnessing air power, blah, blah, blah. But it is a, an incredibly quick turnaround. I mean, you think how, lo you, how long the current British Army was in, in, in Afghanistan with the most modern technology the world has ever known and in 14 years couldn't really kind of make much of a dent in two years in the Far East, you're overwhelming an enemy which has completely crushed you just two years before. Yes, and I think actually that Far East uh, element is, is something that's really important. When we, when we do look at the British Army, too often when we think about the British Army not being particularly useful in, in the Second World War or being ponderous and slow and not really able to, to, to capitalise on success, it's because it's very much bound up in this concept of Dunkirk was defeat and it was quite humiliating you know, for all the success that the Navy had in getting those soldiers off the beach. You know, it was actually a bit of a, you know, we've been whipped and driven out by, by a far greater advance and better German army. But we, but, and then we don't really revisit the role of the army until Normandy uh, in 44. We completely neglect everything that's happening elsewhere. I mean, you yeah. mentioned Alexander uh, right at the top of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the program. And, you know, Alexander, is, is, he is a, 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 not only is he a major general in his own right, who is achieving considerable success, he is the leading player in Italy. You know, he is not the junior partner in that coalition. No. You know, he, he is Britain and he is dominant. You know, we, we're very much bound up in this idea about, you know, Montgomery and, and versus Patton and Bradley and then Eisenhower sitting all over the top of it. And sometimes when we come to talk about, you know, the Second World War, we are just a little bit too North European centric, I think, when it comes to the army, certainly. Uh, and when we look further afield and you look to something like the 14th Army fighting in Burma, you know, a million men, that's the largest Commonwealth army. Uh, Britain yeah. ever has. It, it, that is a united nation as well because 80% of that army is not from Britain yes. uh, and the, the ability to to turn that into a coherent fighting force that's based on rigorous effective yeah. and, and successful 30, training. Ration, 30 different rational scales a day yeah, yeah. you know that's you know and yeah. it, it is and it is this operational level that that I've been sort of banging the drum for for, for, for many years but it is, it is so important that, that people understand that it is not just about whether you can march forward and fire a rifle or fire a tank or whether your tank's got a bigger gun than a tiger or, or vice versa. It is about how you maintain that effort all the time. Uh, yeah, and, and the logis logistics that go into to running the, the 14th Army, you mentioned the rational scales, but also let's not forget, you know, Harry mentioned the, the development of air power in the Western Desert. You know, the logistical effort of, of keeping that army rolling uh, uh, after you know, from, from Alamein to Tunisia, it is is absolutely astounding. It's one of the greatest logistical feats the British Army's probably ever accomplished. But again, it, it's it's how we pull these things out into wider discussion to help us just better understand. You know, no one's saying that people are wrong because they don't know all this stuff yes. when we come to talk about the, the value of the army. It's just let's just broaden the conversation out of some of these things. Well, let's well, just comment on that yeah, one, perhaps. Come in. Or... Yeah, come in. Just uh, that's fascinating to me to hear because I think of the Navy's expansion in, in the Second World War. So it starts off just around 200,000 regulars, reservists, and it, it, it quadruples that and a little more. Um, but the kind of expansion that Peter's talked about is, is exceptional. You know, um, the Navy does have to create new navies. You think about actually the fleet air arm, which goes up to about 75,000 and is, you know, vital in the Pacific War. Um, you have to remember that the, the Royal Naval Air Service was disbanded in, in 1918 and folded into the RAF. And I'm, I'm not going to reheat the pain that that still causes people. But um, it's just, I think the general point 
about creation of new services, certainly also about um, use of forces from elsewhere. You know, the Navy operating with the Royal Indian Navy all the way down into Burma and Arakan in a kind of coastal operation. Having to learn to do that is a new way of warfare. Um, but the kind of numbers that Peter is talking about, um, I can't conceive of. It's an entirely different force. And the cultures and the personnel and the behaviours that had to go with it were so different, I think. I think we should talk about, uh, let, let's turn on to kind of sort of myth and memory and, oh. and how, how we perceive the Second World War. Because, you know, there is this sort of, I, I think there is a, a, a kind of a, a theory for a lot of people that go something like this, that, that we were unprepared for war, um, that we, we were kind of Little Britain, David against the Goliath of the... the, the Nazi Moloch, um, the, the, the few and a few Captain Mannering types kind of sort of managed to kind of keep us at bay. We kind of hung off the shirt tails of the Americans <coughs> of the war. Um, the Soviet Union took the lion's share of the, of the, of the, of the beating um, and eventually we were still there at the end through kind of stint of blitz spirit and just sort of sticking at it. Uh, and I kind of think most of that is completely unfair and, and, and unjust. And of course, the big markers are the Battle of Britain, D-Day, um, those are in Alamein, those are the kind of ones that everyone remembers. And, you know, a lot of it is, a lot of many aspects of the Second World War have just disappeared from sort of public consciousness. And I think that's a great shame. And I think one of the, one of the reasons why D-Day is so important is because you can hop on a ferry and go and see a beach and it's quite a nice place to go and visit. Whereas you're not really going to be going up into kind of the Northern Atlantic or <laughs> or uh, sort of bobbing around sort of mid-Atlantic kind of sort of pondering about the Battle of the Atlantic are you? So those are the kind of problems you have I think. Yeah I think definitely the when it comes to the the way in which we, we do remember and talk about this stuff definitely the, the you know the, the, the physical landscape of memory is very different for the for the for different services you know I mean actually at the National Army Museum we almost sometimes have a bit of a challenge with this because the majority of the army's experiences and these great battles that people associate with the army happened you know somewhere else you know, we, we, you know the army's not really some of the army's greatest moments haven't really taken place within the british isles but you know it's if you compare it to someone like the navy where, which fights at sea or the air force which fights thousands of feet in the air you know at, at least you can visit and walk these battlefields but i think in terms of what we remember of the second world war it, it, this is fascinating because you have d-day as being this great incredible amazing effort and yet people still don't i still people don't really perhaps realise that, you know, there are more British and Canadians at D-Day than there are Americans. Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and, well, and, and I mean, Hollywood, the Hollywood has a huge role to play in all this, doesn't it? Because, you know, America is, is the biggest part of the film industry in the world. It's got the most money and it's got the most people. And obviously, if you're going to stump up the cash for a new film or a new TV, 10-part TV series about a particular unit in the Second World War, and you're American, you're going to make sure it's American. Uh, I mean, you know, what's interesting about Band of Brothers, for example, is is no one on Band of Brothers is claiming that that Easy Company of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment won the entire war. They're just that just happens to be a series about a company of paratroopers. But because that is the series which everyone goes to and turns to, there is this there is this in, interpretation by viewers that that is what is being conveyed. But actually, that's not the case. You know, if, if Britain wants a kind of greater role in D-Day, what we need to do is start making films about landing on Sword Beach or... It's, it's not even that, you know. I mean, let's look, at, let's look at Varsity. I mean, Varsity is the largest airborne operation yeah. ever yes. that, that Britain takes part in. You know, that there's a, carrying the, the sixth airborne takes a thousand aircraft and gliders. A thousand aircraft and gliders carry British, British soldiers alone over the Rhine to drop them. You know, the whole armada, the whole aerial armada of that, it took, it took more than two hours for it to cross a given point. It's so long, that aerial. And yet, isn't it amazing when we talk about aerial operations in this, of the Second World War, you know, it, it's, it's, it's either, it's either D-Day because of Band Brothers yep. or, or, or as Arnhem, um, which is a spectacular failure, which is in, in itself a bit of an interesting one. You know, we don't talk about the successes like Varsity. You mean, you, you, James, your book's coming out about Sicily. Soon, where obviously you know this is a bit of a, a proven ground for that, and it is much more successful. And yet, I don't know; it's just not something that we seem to, seem to fix. Oh, on. And Harry, I mean, I'm kind of, you know, it's interesting to that, that Harold Macmillan in 1960 was saying we really should stop all this nonsense with memorials about the Battle of Britain. I mean, you know, it's, it's old hat now. You know, let's move on. And yet here we are, and, and you know, the Battle of Britain veterans are venerated, and and you. Know, you know, we mourn them every time another one passes away. 
you know, spitfires are flying over, Captain now Colonel Tom Moore. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it is incredible, isn't it? And yet there's so many aspects of the Second World War, which, uh, um, um, the IRS part in it, which don't get a look in. Um, we've already touched on Coastal Command. There's also still a kind of a bit of a black marker about the strategic air campaign, isn't there, and the role of Bomber Command? Yeah, I think, so just unpacking that a little bit, starting with the Battle of Britain, then I think it's really important to see that that is almost mythologized within the war itself. Yeah. Churchill plays a huge part in selling this, partly to get American support in, it's, it's, you know, they're, they're glamorized the fighter pilots then, and then in his subsequent histories of the war, uh, he again expounds on their view, almost to double down on it, but also because he's got a lot of caches, caches associated with it already. And so he sells it once more, and his histories shaped a lot of the post-war debate about the Second World War. And so it's important, once again, in, in driving that. But it's interesting when, for instance, we, we've mentioned the, the Battle of Britain flight, uh, when it was founded, it wasn't called that. It was when the Lancaster joined it, that suddenly it became Battle of Britain flight, which is quite <laughs> ironic. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, yeah, the strategic bombing campaign, by contrast, we like to minimise the conversation about it because it is controversial. Uh, but it's what the RAF was doing for most of the war. You know, 40,000 men, I think, lost doing it. A really important aspect of British air power. Americans then join in. You know, the whole debate about whether or not you could have done it a different way. It, uh, for a long period, this was the only time we could strike Germany. Uh, it's, I feel sorry for Peter because, of course, the army's not really doing very much against the German main force for a lot of this. You know, he's got a tough... Tough gig, uh, selling the army's role in this. Um, but you know, the RAF really is, you know, taking the fight into Germany, and it's being sold. The Blitz is, of course, still mythologised. We talk about Blitz spirit, but people didn't want to hear about Britain can take it by the end of of 1941. They wanted to know that Britain could give it, and that's what Bomber Command was doing. And I think it, it is something which raises questions. I often have to give a, a talk to RTS Halton. Uh, the cadets who, who come in. And I, I explicitly draw this up. I ask them what they think about it after I've given them the facts. And it's interesting to see quite a lot of them say they wouldn't do it. Uh, I, I always admire those who put their hands up and say they would actually. Um, but it's, it Aaron, is interesting. Let me turn something on to you because, because I, think it, I, I think it's interesting. I think it was it, it, the whole point of a, of a, of a government and, and war leaders is to, um, is to win their war and to protect as many of their own citizens as they possibly can. Uh, and the strategic air campaign is part of this steel not flesh policy um and it is as you point out the only real way you can strike it i think one of the things about the way we teach the second world war is that you have to be very careful not to kind of view things entirely through the prism of our contemporary uh, our contemporary viewpoint and one of the issues that, that, that we have is, is that everyone's always constantly saying, you've got to make history relevant. You've got to make it history, you know, relevant for the young, you know, as though they can't cope with kind of extreme violence or, or, or anything like that. I mean, you know, you have to look, Britain was fighting with what it had uh, in a way that was protecting the most, as many people of, of, um, as it possibly could. And, and one of those ways, and it has to be argued, was incredibly successful with strategic air, area bombing. Now, that did, of course, lead to a huge amount of destruction. But as the RF repeatedly pointed out, the moment you stop the war, Hitler, will stop bombing your cities, which, of course, wouldn't have happened to the Holocaust once the war had ended in, if it had ended in Hitler's favour. Um, you know, I, I, I get the, the debates about Dresden, um, but even Dresden, you know, had 136 um, factories making war material. It was a hotbed of Nazism. It was a request by the, the Russians. It was a major rail hub. We didn't necessarily have to target the center of the old town, um, but as a military target, by 1945 standards, it was entirely justified. Yeah, I, I think Dresden, I, I don't think we want to call the conversation too much here. I think it's important to recognize there are two controversies within one. And yeah. often it's the larger strategic bombing campaign and what the objectives that should have been going for, which is yeah. covered within Dresden. And we need to discuss that. That's something people should have an opinion on. They should yeah. decide, was that a greater immorality than uh, attacking Nazi Germany and potentially allowing it to succeed in its objectives? That's a view that people should have. I think, I know that for Matthew once again, I think that the only thing I'd, I'd add for 
the 45 is back. It's a shame that we talk about Dresden and not, say, for instance, Operation Manor, where um, anniversary has just come up. Yes, humanitarian yes. aid relief, it's of great relevance to what the RAF is doing today, of course, because it's still involved heavily in delivering humanitarian aid, flying into Holland, delivering 65,000 tons of yes, uh, yes. food as they're starving. I yeah. think that goes to really the point, actually. Yeah. I, I think that's what the army and the navy are doing as well in terms of, of supplying uh, the logistics of it. That's something which we could go into as well. I think forty five because it's hugely important. Yeah, yeah Matthew, you want to say? James, can I just come in? I mean, there's the issues about how um, current generations are uh, led to understand the war. Um, my personal low, I think, is U five seven one, in which John Bon Jovi um, plays a key role in capturing um, Enigma machines, <laughs> and, and you know, it's the event that never happened. Um, do you know what? I haven't even watched it. I've just read the reviews. Um, I think the other issue, though, is how the services themselves, post-war and also today, have made use of the memory. And I think the Navy is just, as a kind of quick run-through, is an interesting one. I mean, the Navy, I think, had um, a pretty exceptional, an exceptionally successful war on balance. You know, yeah. it was very aggressive and it, it was, um, I think it learned some painful lessons from the First World War and so on. But I think it has made relatively little use, and I think it makes relatively little use in its institutional memory now about it. And it's interesting to ask why different services do different things. Clearly, Fleet Air Arm, you know, they, they have um, Taranto Knights, and that's a part of their legend. I think the submarine service, you know, you start to see in the Second World War the um, veneration of the sort of the the Jolly Rogers that each submarine will fly and the sort of celebration of a pirate tradition. And you're able at once to call the U-boats pirates and killers of, 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 of seamen and then celebrate the service itself sinking. And there's still a bit of that. But the Navy itself, I think, is still probably burdened by um, looking back to Trafalgar and to Nelson. And that is its kind of founding touchstone. Um, and they probably haven't had to create, and they also suffered, I think, in the First World War for venerating Nelson and looking for a Trafalgar moment. Um, but it's just interesting looking at it. I don't think the Navy has made the use, perhaps, that other services have, and I'm thinking probably particularly Harry of RAF as a younger service having to create that touchstone. Um, so I think there are inconsistencies there. It's a, well, I would agree with that. If you look at, sorry, sorry just Peter, just very quickly. I mean, you know, one of the, the exceptional skill of, of, of the Royal Navy is, is you know, second to none, really. I mean, the seamanship levels were extremely high. And because the Royal Navy was large in 1939 anyway, the world's largest navy, you know, you've got that, you've got that ground base so that when you need to rapidly expand, you've got experience and knowledge that can be spread through that expanding force. And, you know, if you want one example of the skill of Royal Navy, you've only got to go back to Normandy, that kind of yep. constant reference point, and go to Long Sumer and look at those Kriegsmarine, the German naval guns, and you can see where a shell from HMS Ajax has actually hit the protective shield of one of those guns and then smashed into the breach, knocking it out. Now, that's fired from six miles away. You've got no yep. GPS. You've got no laser guiding. I mean, that is... That is gunnery of just the highest skill. You know, that's one of the reasons why we won the war. Yeah, and I think Normandy, I just want to touch on that briefly, is that actually disproportionately, you know, we supplied the naval forces um, for Neptune. You know, we've done that similarly on um, the landings in Sicily. It was kind of a specialism that we developed. Yes. Okay, we were using new kinds of, of, of landing ships and landing craft that, may well have been built in the US. But if you look at some of the continuity we've got there, if you look at uh, somebody like Ramsey, his career, he's at, he's at Dunkirk, he's at Torch, he's in Sicily, he's there in Normandy, and he's at Volcaran as well. Yeah. The problem is he dies in January 45, doesn't get to write his memoirs or speak to this in later life. But it's a kind of specialism we offer. Um, and you have to remember that we had then to keep the channel say, you know, through the months post June, we had to supply that logistics. And if you don't protect from e boats, you get what happened at Slapton Sands and you get, you know, hundreds of servicemen killed. So we don't like to tell that because we like to depart from the beaches and tell what happened from there. 
Um, no, I think that's a, that's a point well made, but I think just to go back to the beaches, it's important to understand that of the kind of uh, 1,213 warships, 892 yeah. of them were British. You yeah. know, of the 4,127 landing craft, 3,263 were British. You know, that, yeah. that is an absolutely monster uh, contribution. However, we are drawing close to the end. So I suppose I'd just like to very, very briefly, just a sort of a minute or so, take each of you in turn and just say, ask you about what your plans are going forward for, for museums. I know that we are in certain times, but, but what, what would you hope that on this 75th anniversary of VE Day, that how do you see the legacy of, of the Second World War continuing? And, and Matthew. Yeah, I mean, I think it is interesting. It's probably, um, we benefited, I think, from First World War, the centenaries that we run through from a bit more perspective, you know, as we start to move beyond living memory, I think that's going to be important. I think it will be important. And I think historians have done the job of telling some painful truths and having a rigorous examination. I don't think we've always been able to do that in our museums. So I think as we look ahead, we've got opportunities to do that. I think from my own perspective, I'd like to see, um, I'd like to see an understanding of the imperial and kind of global aspects of the war and the Navy's role in that. You know, we focus on things that are about defending our island and, and so on, but there's an awful lot that exists outside the European theater even. Yes. And the connection or to the wealth that trade and ourselves as an imperial power give us and that how that helps us sustain and fight the war, I think is important. So. I, I guess I'm just hoping once we can get through this, if we can get through this, that we have an option to look at that. Yeah. yeah. And, and Harry, what about you in the RAF museums? It's, it's, a, it's a level question. One, one of the things I did before this, uh, this discussion was I asked some of my friends uh, who aren't as into history uh, what they know about the Second World War. And uh, sorry. Always um, <laughs> I haven't done a very good job apparently uh, but yeah I think that's something which we need to recognize but outside of the circles we have where we're fascinated by, by history military history the general public don't necessarily have a deep knowledge of the second world war even for things which are crucial to the RAF like the battle of Britain I think there's a lack of understanding about what that is on on the home front it's better partly because it's taught in schools the blitz rationing those those are things people get more but I think the bombing war, for instance, these are things we should engage with because we should be asking people what they think about it and also saying, what does this mean post-war? How did this shape what Britain did after the Second World War? The engagement with Europe, which uh, Britain engaged with post-Second World War, was a complete break to its foreign policy for hundreds of years before that. Uh, far more so, I think, than the Americans becoming involved in Europe, though that was dramatic. And of course, that special relationship is driven by the RAF's personal relationships with Air Force commanders in the US. I think we've got a really interesting story to tell. Uh, the technology as well, you know, the, the jet engine is, yes. I think we've got to plug it. Uh, it's fostered by the RAF um, and it's freely given to the Americans because there's a recognition that post-war there is a greater threat and it, it's a really interesting aspect of um, the RAF's and Britain's history. And I think shows just how cutting edge Britain's research was and technology is crucial to the RAF throughout the Second World War. Yeah, because I don't think a lot of people appreciate that the jet engines by, and jet technology by the end of, uh, by 1945, you know, we were the world leaders. I mean, it wasn't the Germans. The Germans might have had the ME262 and all the rest of it, but, but in terms of jet engine technology, we were the leaders at, at, at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, sorry, before that, though, you know, you look at radar, that, that stuff which goes into every single aspect of, of the Second World War. We talk about Battle of the Atlantic. You know, it's Bowen's research, which uh, develops the air surface vessel research, which um, is used in coastal command, but also goes into helping the Navy as well. I think the RF has got a fantastic story to tell just from its, its technology cutting edge side of it. Yeah. And Peter, finally. So, I mean, at the National Army Museum, what we want to continue to do is to build on people's you know, deep emotional connection to the Second World War. You know, this is a real foundation and touchstone, I think, of our national culture. Uh, and we want to show people that, you know, the story of Britain is very much bound up in the, in the story of the army. We want to continue to nurture that. We want to continue to help people discover more about what their family members did if they're curious. We want to help them learn more about the, the, the situations and the places that they were involved in. 
But looking ahead also, you know, our, our upcoming exhibition, which, which sadly was supposed to open next week and has now been, been pushed back slightly, is actually going to look at everything that happens after 1945. You know, what, what does Montgomery say? He says, now we've won the German war, but now we must win the peace. And for the army in particular, you know, the, yes, the fighting ended in Europe, at least, uh, on the 8th of May, 1945. It continued in the Far East. And look, at, we will be continue to do a whole lot of programming and events looking towards VJ Day on the 15th of August of this year too. But our special exhibition is going to look at the role that the army played in Germany uh, in particular, because, you know, it, it, it went static and went firm occupying this territory, which it fought so hard to claim. And then it played a major role in rebuilding that country. Uh, some enormous uh, companies, for example, that we know around the world, Volkswagen was resurrected and revived as a result of the work of the British army. But more importantly than that, and Harry alluded to it slightly, it was about standing on that front line in the Cold War as well when Britain was prepared to, yep. to stand and fight along various positions of, of, it, of its occupation zone in, in, in northwest Germany. Um, and this became a major foundation point for, for global politics because that was effectively the front line in the Cold War. Uh, and our exhibition will, will talk to people about that, show people what it was like to serve in the army that was there uh, and put that into the overall arching context of this, of this glorious British army history that we're, we're so proud to tell. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, I have absolutely no doubt at all that COVID-19 will be beaten and that your museums will all be open in swift order and that people will be flooding back to them. And I would urge everyone to go and visit them because every single one of them is just utterly fantastic. And I've spent many a happy hour there myself, I have to say. So this is going to be followed by a live Q&A crowdcast at 7 p.m. Thursday, the 10th of May. And then, Peter, you and I are back in action at 2 p.m. on V Day 75 itself. Um, that's Friday, the 8th of May. Um, but in the meantime, Matthew, Harry, Peter, thank you all very much. Thank you. Great talking to you. Cheers.